Hello, uh, welcome back. I'm Rebecca Batches, and I've been recording slowly, probably not as quickly as as others would would hope. But um, I've been recording an episode series of guiding videos, um, especially geared toward the new infection preventionists. This is going to be episode three, monthly infection prevention activities. So if you've been following along, I started with episode one, which were a lot of the common daily infection prevention activities. And then we moved into episode two, which were a lot of our weekly responsibilities as infection preventionists. And now we're at episode three, monthly infection prevention activities. And of course, we always have to add a bit of humor into our lives as IPs, right? Um, and this is one of my favorite memes that I've seen throughout the years on social media. Uh, on the left side here, how nurses enter a room with one bed bug. Um, you can see they're all suited up in every form of PPE available in the facility um, versus how nurses enter an MRSA room. And um, uh, many of us have actually moved away from contact precautions in MRSA. And this is a great segue to remind all of you that Shea has just updated its MRSA compendium uh, recommendations and guidelines. Um, interestingly, uh, we're still focusing on just MRSA. There's some debate out there that maybe we should be looking at all staph aureus. I certainly would be a proponent of that. Um, but the meme is, is funny, none the least. Um, disclaimer. I always provide a disclaimer on these videos, especially as more people are watching them. I wanna remind you that if you're watching, these are general guidelines for particularly for new infection prevention professionals. It doesn't replace any existing policies and procedures. I'm sorry, I can't wave a magic wand and make those go away for you. You certainly are able to ask the question to your leadership or to your colleagues in infection prevention or quality why you're doing certain practices, especially if the results of that data isn't being shared. We know that all healthcare settings are unique and they require a tailored approach. And uh, the template that I'm going to link in the, in the comments is just an example of the typical ongoing infection prevention activities I've been exposed to. I've been in the field of infection prevention for 16 years. I've worked in healthcare for 22 years now. The years are passing quicker than I can count them, quite frankly. And I've forgotten to give this tip on my other videos, but I like to remind people that when you're in YouTube, you can actually turn on closed captions if you are hard, hard of hearing or you speak maybe a language other than English, you can actually translate the captions into your language of choice. And if I speak too slowly for you, I, I tend to try to keep my pace of speaking slow because when I talk about infection prevention, I get really excited and I can start talking really fast. But if I'm talking too slow for you and you're trying to speed me up, you can actually control the speed of the video in the lower right-hand corner too. So those are my tips to you. Again, Current state of infection prevention, I've said this in the, the two preceding videos, we all know that infection preventionists right now are exhausted, overwhelmed, um, overworked, um, and many of us, but not all, are under-resourced. And what we've seen throughout the pandemic is many um, infection preventionists retiring or leaving the field altogether, which is very unfortunate because we're losing many decades of expertise. We likely have an unprecedented unprecedented number of new inexperienced IPs in the field. And we need lots of resources. That's what I've been hearing from all of you. And the videos that I'm recording is my own attempt to help all of you in the best way that I can and, and reach as many people as possible. And again, the comments and feedback I'm getting is very positive. So I will continue to do these whenever I have the time. And as long as you see them valuable. The purpose of the training series is to provide general guidance on how to approach the average workload of an infection preventionist in the United States. I have never worked outside of the U.S. There are certainly differences from an accreditation and regulatory standpoint, and so please don't interpret my general guidelines to replace any of your 
especially federal or national expectations in the field of infection prevention and control. And of course, that the series is also based on just one me, one IP's experience. Uh, although I have been around for a bit, it doesn't, again, replace any of your facilities, policies, and procedures. Let's start with monthly activities, and we'll start with something fun, uh, state regional meetings, um, state and or regional meetings. And here is a picture um, from the National APIC Conference in Indianapolis in 2022. And all of the members of my own APIC chapter, APIC Great Lakes in Michigan. And uh, I really don't know where I would be without some of these women and men who have been inspiring and motivational and mentors to me in the field of infection prevention and control. And so this is our group picture we try to get every year. So here are some examples of reoccurring monthly meetings you might have to block in your calendar. And that's one of my other big pieces of advice is that you wanna block as much as you can in your calendar so you're not caught off guard. And of course, knowing that other people tend to use the calendar function to schedule meetings with you to see your availability. And although that might be very basic, I think it bears repeating and recognizing, especially if you're new to the field, the more you can build in and block your calendar consistently, it's gonna help you stay organized over time. So going back to state or regional emergency preparedness meetings might be a great example. If you don't know who in your facility is linked into either your state or regional emergency preparedness, start with your life safety officer for sure. And I definitely think it's very valuable for the infection preventionist to be included in these types of activities. A lot of the times we'll be doing Tabletop drills, maybe pandemic preparedness drills. There's a variety of different bioterrorism, natural disasters, et cetera. And so these are really great activities for the infection preventionist to be involved in. Each state across the United States has different resources, but we are all required to have an HAI or healthcare associated infection coordinator. The CDC has changed up their website a little bit. This is linked into the document, the Google Doc that I'll place below. But even though the website's changed, the concept is the same, that every state in the United States has to dedicate at least one person to the coordination of HAIs. And so you really want to connect with that person, connect regionally, and get keyed into the events that are happening. A lot of the times they are on a monthly basis. And so nobody's gonna reach out and find you most of the time. You're gonna have to go look for these contacts yourself. And if you're lost, go back to your chapter because you know that I strongly recommend you being a member of your local APIC chapter. Turn to someone who's got some experience in your area within your chapter doesn't have to be an official mentor program. You can ask somebody for help, but basically you want to make sure you're keyed into these state and regional calls and webinars that might be happening on a monthly basis. Sometimes they're quarterly, depending on what's going on in the community. <clears throat> you also want to carve out time for those APIC chapter meetings and or webinars, generally at least one hour per month. Each APIC chapter has its own approach to regular meetings. My chapter, for example, we don't meet in person or online monthly. We tend to provide a webinar each month when there are not other conflicting large events like the National APIC Conference. But the important thing is that you actually block your calendar. Again, you're building a consistency and a reliability in your calendar so that you are taking the time to tap into the resources that you need to help you do your job. And to this point, you can always do the APIC on demand education. And if you want to look at the course offerings, you can just Google or do an internet search of APIC online education or on demand education. And you should find a plethora of webinars to help you in your quest to become the best infection preventionist that you can be. Next, we move into the dreaded NHSN activities. And I say dreaded because if you've ever had to log into the system, 
you definitely know that it can be quite an overwhelming experience. The NHS system, in my experience, tends to lag a bit. Sometimes there are issues with logging in. Sometimes you can actually log in, but then you're getting a blank screen and you can't enter anything. And it's usually at that critical point in the month where you have to actually enter everything by a deadline, right? So just to go over, this is certainly by no means uh, intended to be an NHSN education whatsoever. And I'm going to point you in a moment to a great resource for NHSN training. But some of the primary things that we should be keeping up on every month. First, NHSN, at the very least, our CMS mandated reportable surgical procedure and denominator, de denominator data. That's always been a tongue twister. So if this applies to your facility, you fall within the CMS reportable conditions, you know that you're reporting at a very, very minimum um, colectomy procedures and abdominal hysterectomies. And many facilities choose to go beyond that based on their own risk assessment and the high risk procedures that they do at their, their own facility. Per CMS, from a surgical procedure standpoint, if you do colon procedures and abdominal hysterectomies, those you know for certain you are required to report. And you have to report not just infections if they occur, you have to actually enter all of the cases that meet the definition as your denominator. As we know, basic math, and that's all I can do with math is the basics, but we can't have a rate or ratio if we don't have both a numerator and a denominator. And the denominator, of course, is the total number of procedures. And of course, in NHSN, it's just not a whole number. We actually have to feed in all of the procedure-specific data for each case. And that, of course, helps us get a risk-adjusted SIR, or standardized infection ratio. Not every facility in the United States has the benefit of an automated infection prevention software surveillance system. And many of us are actually having to enter manual surgical denominator data into NHSN directly, which is exceptionally time consuming. So my advice to you is to try to work with your EMR team internally, EMR being electronic medical record, to identify any opportunities to make your life a little bit easier if you have to report surgical procedures into NHSN. SSI surveillance is again in a beast unto itself, but you have to know what your minimum requirements are. And per CMS, your minimum requirements are colectomies and abdominal hysterectomies. Folks might be reporting cardiovascular procedures like a cabbage. Many facilities may be getting into spinal type surgeries. And another very popular reporting SSI and data would be our ortho cases, such as hip and knee replacement. Those are not mandated yet, but I actually link in this blue link, and it will be in the document linked in the comments as well, um, the website you can go to to make sure you're always reporting what is required at a minimum per CMS. That's a nice link for you. So we talked about surgical procedures and the denominator data. We also have CMS mandated reportable device denominator data and our actual device associated events. So when we talk about device denominator data, we're talking about the number of Foley catheters and central lines and ventilators if your facility is tracking that. Interestingly, what I don't have typed out here is that ventilator associated events or VAEs are not required by CMS to be reported. So if you're struggling to keep your head above water and you're looking for something to maybe cut back on, that could be a realistic opportunity for you to present to your leadership. Again, VAE ventilator associated events are not required by CMS to be reported. CLAB C, central line associated bloodstream infections, and CAUTI, catheter associated UTIs, 
are required for certain types of units. Our critical care units, whether they be adult, pe pediatric, neonatal, and medical surgical, it's beyond the capability of this video that's intended to be brief and an overview um, to determine what types of units must be reported per CMS regulations. However, you can look at your NHSN procedure manuals to help you determine, but we do know that our critical care and medical surgical, even our combined med surge units are required for device associated reporting. There are facilities across the country that have what is called magnet status, and they actually might be reporting housewide CLABSI and CAUTI events into NHSN. That's one of the many um, magnet requirements that may have changed over the years. So apologies if that is outdated information. So I think it's important that we enter our denominator data regularly. I'm recommending it monthly because you do need a month's worth of data to put in your, your denominators, your device associated denominators into NHSN. So again, this depends, how you're going to do this depends on your facility size and your resources. Some places, I say small facilities here, but even large places, if they don't have a sophisticated electronic medical record or a reliable surveillance software system, they still might be getting manual paper reports from the units or departments directly. And so these reports would include the total number of patients with a Foley, total number of patients with a central line. And again, of course, your denominator would be how many patients overall were there in the month, also called patient days. So you can use your electronic medical record to help you create device reports. There is some literature on this topic. It can help you be more efficient for sure. The NHSN manual actually addresses this and, and tells you that if you're switching from a manual account to an electronic, you have to validate those reports. I think it's about three months before you actually fully transition. So that's something to keep in mind. NHSN event entry, this is linked. Again, keep up on entering your events. You don't really want to backlog this and get too far behind. And again, I provide the link on what CMS requires per facility type uh, via NHSN. It's linked here for you. So ongoing healthcare associated infection or HAI surveillance. In the prior videos, we're really talking about what you would be doing day to day or week to week. And so don't just look at this episode in a vacuum. You definitely want to review the other two episodes. But something you might want to think of on a monthly basis is how you're going to approach surgical site infection surveillance or SSI surveillance. And again, there is no written rule about how you have to go about doing this. I think it would actually be helpful if there was a written rule, but there is no written rule on how exactly you need to perform surgical site surveillance infection, surgical site infection surveillance. It's later in the day and I'm starting to get tired, obviously. But if you are following outpatient or ambulatory surgeries as a part of your overall infection prevention and control program, you might be reaching out to surgeons and or surgeon offices to look at that outpatient or ambulatory population. As I mentioned in, as I mentioned in another video, Ambulatory SSI surveillance is quite challenging because the patients can go all over the place if they have an issue with their, their surgery or their procedure. And those culture results or readmissions or even visits as an outpatient because of an SSI are very difficult to capture. And so if you're struggling with outpatient SSI surveillance, you're not alone whatsoever. One, one of the ways you can attempt to make your outpatient or ambulatory SSI surveillance a bit more robust is sending post-discharge surveillance emails or letters to the surgeons themselves. Um, I have not, I don't have a letter necessarily linked. Actually, what I've had success doing in the past is taking the surgeon's cases and 
and copying and pasting that per month into an email and then having them indicate whether or not any of those patients returned with any issues. Something that's really important when we're talking about SSI surveillance that some of the infection preventionists that I've worked with don't fully understand. So I've bolded it and underlined it here for you in case you two are confused. You are not required by any mandate, CMS or otherwise, to track every single procedure type in a sophisticated, standardized way. That means that you don't have to enter every type of procedure that you do at your facility into NHSM. It doesn't mean that you're responsible for digging into every single surgical procedure type that happens. You want to use your facility's risk assessment to determine the procedures that you're going to proactively track. And so there's active surveillance and passive surveillance. Many of us with SSIs are using passive surveillance where we're looking at things like culture reports and post-discharge surveillance letters. This is passive surveillance, whereas active surveillance might be tracking, you know, from the moment every patient has the procedure on for a specified period of time and we're looking at everybody all together. Active is kind of in the moment. Most facilities across the U.S. don't have the resources to do that type of SSI surveillance. So you really want to hone your focused SSI surveillance on the procedures that are at highest risk to, to your patients. So a great example is if I'm doing podiatry cases and spinal fusion cases, the risk to the patient of infection, morbidity, mortality would likely fall into the spinal category and not necessarily the podiatry category, if that makes sense, right? And so we want to use our time wisely. And to this point, if you're struggling with how to capture this data, how am I going to even know how to identify which surgeons had which cases, work with your IT or EMR site expert to help you develop reports. You're not alone. And a lot of the times those people have a lot of resources they can share with you. Another way to, to perform passive surveillance, although it's kind of active, but it, it still would traditionally meet the, the passive surveillance definition, is to look at reports of returns to the operating room. This might not work in a very large facility where you have hundreds of cases going on in the operating room every day. Um, it might be more feasible in a smaller facility where you can kind of look back at a month's worth of cases and look for key terms like purulent drainage, wound dehiscence, et cetera. And I believe in the daily video, episode one, I also talked about readmission reports where you may have the time and resources to actually look at who's coming in and for what reason. So here are a couple ideas of how you might perform passive SSI surveillance. So I promised that I would give you a resource and I didn't realize that this orange slide would turn me orange as well. So it's really important. We talked about blocking time for your, your reoccurring meetings to make sure you don't miss those because they're really important. Equally important is blocking time in your calendar for NHSN training. Now every year in March, typically, the CDC hosts a virtual training session. It goes the entire week in March. It's a great opportunity for you to attend every session that you would be responsible for, and you really wanna carve that time out. But beyond the annual training, you need to make sure you understand the definitions as much as possible. So please, please, please utilize the educational training that the CDC provides within the NHSN webpage and the link is here and I'll drop that into the comments as well. These are very complex definitions, um, even HAI definitions that seem simple at first can be more complicated than you might imagine and so you really need to block time to do NHSN training in fact, I would even go far, as far to say that you shouldn't be entering data into NHSN until you've actually gone through and done and performed the most basic 
training. And there are a ton of tools for you on this website, so please use them. Next, from an antimicrobial stewardship related standpoint, I think I think you may have heard if you've listened to my other videos that antimicrobial stewardship is not the infection preventionist's responsibility. Typically, this is led by a pharmacist, hopefully someone who has training in infectious disease antimicrobial stewardship. Not every facility has the luxury of an infectious disease physician. If you've been working in large academic centers in urban areas, you might not be aware that there's a plethora of rural community hospitals that don't have all of the luxuries that we have in the urban acute care centers. So, and the, and the larger health systems, right? So not every facility might have an infectious disease physician leading up their antimicrobial stewardship related activities. But again, this is not the responsibility of the infection preventionist to own. Here are some ideas of how you might use antimicrobial data and reports to support your work as an infection preventionist. To start, of course, you need to attend or at least participate in your facility's antimicrobial stewardship committee. That is within our purview and that is something you'd be expected to do. Ideas of what you might be doing at your antimicrobial stewardship committee is re reviewing your MDRO trends, maybe assisting pharmacy with getting into NHSN and tackling what those reports look like because you have the familiarity or you will, hopefully one day soon. We're getting more and more people involved with NHSN and more and more hospitals are submitting their antimicrobial use data through the NHSN portal. And that means that we have people who've never experienced the world of NHSN now getting involved with it and they might need your help. Even if you don't think you're an expert, you know more than they do. So you might look at antimicrobial reports day to day or week to well, monthly is the point of this video. And this would only be feasible in a very small facility, you know, maybe 36 beds or under. And I say this, pharmacy should have some sort of data for you. And in my past, pharmacy actually had a report of all of the antimicrobials given after day three and beyond. And it could just help me do a quick review of anything that might look suspicious of an HAI. And this report would exclude surgical prophylaxis because of course that would not be indicative of, uh, of an HAI. It all depends on what resources pharmacy has. Again, I've worked in the very large medical, like academic medical center. And then I've also worked at a very small community hospital that had um, way less resources. So again, just reemphasizing that it's not the IP's responsibility to check that antibiotics are appropriate. We are not prescribers, but these reports might reveal new HAIs. Again, any antibiotics started after day three from admission could be an indicator of an issue. For an antimicrobial stewardship program, antibiotic usage should be tracked and monitored by pharmacy and this can be done in different ways. I just talked about the NHSN antimicrobial use module. Um, it's called AUR. And if your facility is not participating in that, at the very least, they should have a daily dispensed doses, um, sometimes called a DDD report that can actually just track any, any variances in antimicrobial prescribing. More rounding. I think we talked about running in, in the weekly activities video, but we wanna kind of space this out. Environment of care rounds, this frequency is really dependent on the number of sites under your regulatory umbrella um, or your CMS, um, CCN. And again, how many sites you have is going to determine how often you can actually get out into these sites. There is, no requirement on the frequency. It used to say six months, I believe, in the CMS guidance or requirements, regulations. Um, now it's up to the facility policy to determine how frequently you get out to these places. So you actually might want to be thinking about the risk setting. So if you have an ambulatory surgical center, maybe you'd get out there more than twice a year. Maybe you need to visit that place four times a year. 
you want to be looking at risk stratification, not just getting out there to just check the box. <clears throat> Device rounds, um, this is also completely dependent on your facility resources. I personally believe that infection preventionists should not own device rounding. So we're talking about central lines, Foley catheters, or any indwelling urinary catheter, ventilators, et cetera. Um, I believe that we shouldn't own this process because we're not the clinicians who care and maintain these devices. And we're also not the ones that document on the devices either. And so if we really want a robust program, we need to build that into the clinicians who are responsible for charting these devices and actually asking the question every day, ideally every shift, whether or not the device is appropriate. But the infection preventionist might be an additional resource, somebody who comes in to regularly validate that the clinicians are actually keeping their eyes on the lines. Um, if you see issues with charting as you're doing your device-associated infections investigations, um, this might be where the opportunity arises. It's a good idea to kind of keep track. You have to report every month, at least for your required units, your device utilization, so your Foley utilization and your central line utilization. Looking at that over time helps identify variations. And so if you see the numbers jump around a little bit, it could be a red flag that there's either a true increase or decrease in utilization, or if you rely on electronic reports, it could indicate there's a problem with, with your actual report. Or if the numbers are changing greatly, it could actually also mean that a process has changed if you're doing manual counts up on the department or unit. And so that's just a good idea to kind of look at these things month to month to see that you're around the same percentage. So in your surgical intensive care unit, for example, if you've got a 75% Foley catheter or indwelling urinary catheter utilization, and one month it peaks to 90%, you know, that's a big increase from what your baseline is. And so that's an indicator of something you need to investigate. So that wraps up episode three, monthly activities for the new infection preventionist. I clearly did not plan much of this script. There was no script as always, but I hope to see you in the next episode, which will be episode four, when we talk about quarterly and annual activities. And that should wrap up this series on the infection preventionist typical activities um, going from daily, weekly, monthly, all the way to annual activities. So feel free to leave me feedback. And thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video.